After the whole Audacity situation with Muse Group purchasing that project, I started seeing one very similar question, and that is how does a company actually purchase a free software project? Isn't that project owned by its contributors? Why should a company like that have any right to profit for someone else's work? And I think this whole misunderstanding comes from a general misunderstanding of what free software actually is and what sort of protections your project actually gets when it is using a GPL-like license, say GPLv2 or GPLv3. Because when it comes to a software project, regardless of whether it's open source, free software using GPLv2 or GPLv3, or maybe it's even a proprietary project, it doesn't matter what the license actually is, this project is still an asset that can be sold. Now, when you do have external contributors, it does start to get a little bit more complicated, but we'll get into that in just a bit. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so if you're looking to purchase the project or someone's trying to purchase your project, seek actual legal advice. I'm just here to give you a general understanding of how this usually will work. The most obvious thing that can be sold without having to worry about the license or how many contributors you have, if there's one contributor or a thousand contributors, you can still go and do this. And that is selling the rights to actually maintain the repo. While this might not seem that powerful on a small project like say a terminal file manager like LF, if you sell the rights to do that for something like say MySQL Server, if you have the right to maintain the repo, you're the one who controls what commits actually get added into the code base. And ultimately, you can control the entire direction of the project. Now, when you are the maintainer, you can't just go and do whatever you want. If you are the sole owner of the project, obviously, then you can, but usually there'll be some external contributors. So you couldn't go and like take the project proprietary without contacting the contributors or changing the license or doing anything like that, but you still control the direction of the project. Now, typically when you contribute code to a project, you don't give up all your rights to that code. You maintain your copyright of that code and then you will license it out to that project. Basically what you're saying to the project is here is my code. I am giving you the right to use it under the terms of the license of the project. Whatever that license is, it doesn't really matter. But if it's say a GPL v2 project, they can't just go and re-license that code for some other use case without directly contacting you or rewriting that bit of code. This is why when you contribute to an FSF project, they get you to assign your copyright to the FSF. Basically what you're saying is, this is the code that I have written, I would like to give you this code, and now you are the owner of that code. What this allows the FSF to do is move from say GPLv2 to GPLv3, and if there's a GPLv4 in the future, then they can move all the code to that without having to go and contact each of the individual contributors. Now, if you're the sole copyright holder of a project, because let's say you just don't accept any external contributions, you can go and sell that copyright to whoever you want. And then once you've done that, they will now be the legal owners of that code. Now, with external contributors, it's much, much harder because usually you don't get that copyright assignment. The most direct route for a company would be contacting each of the individual contributors and then purchasing the copyright of whatever code they have written. The problem with this though is most projects have a core development team and then you have maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand other contributors who've done like one or so little commits. Let's say they've changed some documentation or maybe they've changed like a function. Each of those people do need to be contacted if this is the route you're going to take. Now, usually when you're a small project, the maintainership rights and the copyright of the code is everything to the project. There's nothing external to the project that would actually hold any value in this situation. But when you get to the size of something like Audacity, GIMP, Blender, anything like this, you're also going to have trademarks to protect as well. This grant to the rights use a specific name and a specific logo while also letting you protect yourself from others who might be using it maliciously. Let's say they're claiming to be an official distributor of your project or they're affiliated with you. You actually then have legal grounds to stop them from doing so. And for a small project with basically no users, this doesn't really hold that much value. If you have basically no users with one name and one logo, if you go and change that, well, now you have basically no users with a different name and a different logo. But when you actually have brand name recognition, you're doing marketing campaigns, making sure you have a consistent name and a consistent logo 
makes it so people can actually easily find your project and know who you actually are. And like you may expect, this can be bought and sold like anything else affiliated with your project. Now, this actually can create some problems. So if you were to go and say, sell the copyright of your code to one group and then sell the trademark to another and then sell the maintainership rights to a whole different group. Now you've got like these three different groups that all own different parts of the project, but don't own enough to say they're actually the owner. If you have the maintainership rights to the project, but you don't actually own the source code, well, you don't really have any control over the past of the project. You can control the new direction of it, but that's as much as you can do. If you own the maintainership rights and the copyright, but you don't own the trademark, well, now you actually have to go and change your name to something completely different. Otherwise, you're going to be infringing on that trademark. So if it's possible, a company is going to want to buy all of these things to then be the actual owner of the project. But as I mentioned earlier, Buying the copyright of the code can be incredibly difficult if there are external contributors, but there is something else you can buy as well. So it's all well and good to own a project, but you actually need people to develop it if you want to keep adding in new features and fixing bugs and all of those things that make a project actually work. And the best way to do that is just go and employ the main contributors to the project. So usually when you work for a dev company, you're going to sign away your rights to the code. Usually when you work on anything during your work hours, you don't maintain your copyright to that and everything just goes to the company because it's much easier for them to manage that rather than having, say, people spending their work time working on some side project and then taking it out of the company and then starting their own business. Basically, the company is just trying to protect themselves from that actually happening. This is the reason why, say, a developer at Google can't go and just take source code they're working on internally and then just release it publicly. Well, they can, but... Google will probably sue them into oblivion. Now, how feasible this is really depends on the size of the project. If you have a massive project, and let's say you have a really big core dev team where each of the members work on their own individual parts, and there's not really much overlap between them. Maybe in that case, you want to hire all of those people to have a full understanding of the code base. But usually a project's not going to be like that. Usually with the core dev team, there's going to be a lot of overlap between what they actually do. So maybe you don't need to hire everyone, but enough to get a good coverage of the code base. Because something really expensive with the project is training people on how to actually work in that project. On a project that is, say, a couple hundred thousand lines long, you could reasonably spend an entire month just trying to work out what's actually going on in that project. Project. And when you have a project that is that long, there's going to be sections of that code base that aren't written very well. Let's say they're older parts, or maybe they're written by new developers who didn't really know what they were doing, or they've been changed a bunch of times. And all of these things will really affect how long it actually takes to have a good grasp of the code base. So it might just be more cost effective to hire that understanding rather than trying to build it up from nothing. And this is basically what Audacity has done as well. They didn't hire the entire core dev team. They've hired a couple of members and these people know how to work in Audacity so they know how they can start adding the features that Muse Group wants to add. Whether that's a good thing or not is a whole nother story. So being a free software project doesn't magically make the project exist outside of the rest of the development world where projects can be bought and sold without really any hassle actually existing there. Being free software doesn't magically protect it from this actually happening. A free software project is an asset like any of these other projects out there, but because it has a GPL type license on it, the resulting product that you buy might not be, I guess as open to modification as something with a more permissive license would allow you to have. Unless you're the sole rights holder of a project, there's not really much you can do if you don't want a project to be sold. Really, the only thing you can do is make sure you talk to the maintainers and the people who actually own the rights of the project and make sure they understand your concerns and see if you can convince them to do otherwise. But at the end of the day, 
The ones who own the rights to the project are the ones who have the final say. That's going to be it for me. And if you like this video and you want to support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here, please go check out my Patreon, subscribe, star, leave a pay, all linked in the description down below. So I've also got a gaming channel that is Brody Robertson Plays, where I'm live about twice a week and upload about five or so YouTube shorts. I've got a podcast called Tech Over T available as an audio release. Basically, anywhere you can find audio podcast and the video version is available on YouTube and Odyssey and this channel is also available over on Odyssey. That's going to be it for me and I'm out.